have a, a stronger relation with uh, Russia or other countries. I mean, uh, Russia as a, a hub of relations uh, with uh, all the Eurasia system. Right. And we have this tradition of uh, fiat automobiles and trucks being built in Russia. There's a very long uh, tradition of, of cooperation there. So in terms of the conference, uh, could you give us some idea of a couple of people who are coming? Yeah, there will be important um, uh, members of the parliament uh, from uh, Germany, from uh, uh, Norway, from Greece, uh, uh, from Italy as well. Uh, Great. Also from uh, the European Parliament. Uh, there are a lot of people. It's uh, an incredible, uh, crowded uh, conference in, in a way. Um, okay, Pino, so, I'm, I'm uh, sorry. The, the music is on. We have these hard picks built in. Thank you very much. I'll see you very soon, and I'll see you certainly on Monday, the 26th in Rome. And thank you so much. <laughs> World Crisis Radio. Now, earlier in our broadcast, we did a rundown on the visit of Syrian President Assad to President Putin in Moscow. But now we can get the invaluable perspective of Thierry Maison speaking to us from uh, Syria, from Damascus. And uh, this, uh, of course, is uh, a person who has been the really the only Western reporter that we know of who has been in Syria continuously. He's actually been a consultant for the Syrian government and gives you a view that, uh, indeed, you're not going to get in any um, any of the U.S. mainstream media. So, Thierry, welcome, and then please tell us, why did President Assad go to Moscow at this time? So, first, you have to understand that uh, um, for President Assad, it was very difficult to go outside his own country. Because during the first year of war in 2011, there was um, a lot of manipulation tricks from the Western governments, and they tried to organize a coup d'etat inside the country. So during the first year, he was very cautious about that. And uh, since the Geneva Conference in June 2012, a new war restart a totally different, a very hard war, and uh, with uh, a lot of jihadists coming from everywhere in the world. And President Assad became the head of the army. And as the head of the army, he was not able to leave the, the battle uh, and to go to United Nations or to Moscow or everywhere. So during five years, he was always in Syria. But this change with the results of the Russian uh, military campaign in Syria. Right now, the situation is uh, more flexible, and uh, President Assad decided to go to Moscow. But of course, this was very difficult in the sec for security reasons. He has to fly over some jihadist territories or over NATO territories. And in one case, in the both case, it, it could be um, uh, his, his, uh, his plane could be destroyed by jihadists or by NATO. Right. So that's why this trip was totally secret, including the, the ambassador in, uh, in Moscow. He, he doesn't know that the president was coming, the, the Syrian ambassador. All, all the trip was organized by the Russians. And what, why this trip? If you are reading the New York Times or Washington Post, you will read some stupidity because they think that uh, the, the topic of the meeting uh, was uh, uh, about the, the military situation or about the, the way to compose the next government with uh, people from uh, the opposition, the, the moderates. Uh, of course, it's not necessary to organize a, a a meeting like that for such topics, there is a lot of links between the two states. They have a, uh, a lot of uh, uh, meetings at very high level, not the president, but very high le level between the two states. The, the real aim of this meeting was to know how Syria could participate to the Russian plan for peace in the, in the Arab world, not only in the Middle East, but also 
in uh, North Africa. And as you know, as uh, uh, Syria is a, a, a local country where everybody can live uh, mm-hmm. exactly with the, the same rights, uh, without distinction of uh, ethnies, religions, or political parties, this could be an example for the other country in, uh, in the Arab world. This was the real topic of that uh, meeting. And as you, as you see at, in that meeting, you have only President Assad for Syria, but for Russia, you have President Putin, uh, you have the, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, the Minister of Defense, the General Secretary for the National Security Council, and the head of the Secret Services. So they, so they can discuss all the topics about, the, uh, about the, the way to make peace in this part of the world. So, uh, in other words, uh, Syria is a secular country, right? It's not based on any particular religion, open to all, and yes. tolerant, right? Christians, Druzes, uh, Kurds, uh, Sunni, Shia, whatever, Alawite, all tolerated, all getting yes. along under the older system. Yes, and you, you know that since the beginning of the war, uh, the Western media has tried to say that uh, uh, Syria is uh, an, Alawite, an Alawite regime or Alawite dictature, they say. So but this is totally stupid. Of course, the president himself is Alawite, but uh, uh, most of the leaders are not Alawite at all. They are from different uh, uh, religions and sects from the uh, some are Christian, some are Sunni, some are Shia, some are, are Blues, from different um, uh, religions. And uh, uh, this is very important in the ideology of the Ba'ath Party, which is now at power in, uh, in Syria. Of course, it's a, a, a national union government, but the, the main party is always the Ba'ath Party. And for the Ba'ath Party, the, the secular system is uh, uh, something absolutely necessary in that part of the world because of the, the diversity of the, of the people. Yes. But then uh, the Russian plan for the pacification of the Middle East, uh, is it going to be a, an international conference? Can you point us in uh, maybe a little bit more detail on that? Of course, all this is very difficult to to uh, to organize because uh, uh, first we have to know exactly what the U.S. will do or not do. Because, as you explained to to your audience since uh, long years, there is now a, a big division inside the U.S. administration and uh, um, people like uh, Ambassador uh, uh, Samantha Power or. Uh, number two of the United Nations, uh, Jeffrey Feldman, they are totally opposed to the to the peace. Uh, they push uh, for a general war and a big chaos in the Arab world. But uh, it seems that President Obama himself um, is ready to to make peace if he's uh, if he can impose his uh, his own policy to his own administration. Right. And uh, uh, at the end of this uh, of this meeting, the, the Kremlin an- announced that uh, they will try to organize a new meeting with uh, um, probably uh, John Kerry for the United uh, States, uh, somebody for uh, Saudi Arabia, and a third one for Turkey. But right. unfortunately, we don't we don't know. We will be able to represent Turkey. There is now no government. There is a transitional government okay. in Turkey. You will have new elections I, the first. Gary, I'm, I'm sorry, we're, we're out of time. Uh, we we do have that confirmed in the Wall Street Journal that there's going to be this face-to-face meeting. So thank you very much. We we only have uh, the one segment, and we'll we'll see you again very soon. My Back to World Crisis Radio, Webster Tarpley here in uh, Washington, D.C. So we've heard from Pino Capras, uh, that's Rome on the 26th of October, uh, Centro Convegni Cavour in Via Cavour, and then uh, on, uh, actually I'll be speaking November 1st, conference is Halloween and uh, November 1st, and that's in Friedberg, Friedberg uh, Germany in the Frankfurt 
uh, Frankfurt am Main uh, area. Now, we were talking about uh, Bernie, and this is actually, it's quite striking how this has, has worked, right? We saw in the Democratic debate at the very moment when these other candidates, weak though they are, right, O'Malley and Webb and uh, Link, Chafee, they were getting ready to give their best shot at uh, Madame Secretary there about, um, I think it would have been the emails, it would have been Benghazi, but it would have been also some, maybe something about, you know, is, is this uh, this policy good? Right? Who knows? Maybe that's that's what we're thinking. But uh, Bernie stepped in and Bernie said, I don't think your emails are a political issue. I don't care about them. I'm sick and tired of hearing about your damn emails. And she was delighted. She shook hands. She fairly gurgled with pleasure. Um, so now I think it's clear um, that Bernie is a sheepdog, if you will, um, we have all kinds of um, authoritative, right, highly respected uh, websites that talk about Bernie uh, in these, uh, I think, realistic terms, very unflattering, very, um, you know, blunt, that uh, Bernie has been acting as a sheepdog for Hillary Clinton. You know what the sheepdog does, right? If the, if the sheep begin to stray off the ranch, off the reservation— then um, the sheepdog goes to work and brings them back in. And one of the points, I think one of the more interesting articles is the one by Bruce Dixon in the uh, Black Agenda Report, right? I think this is one of the most important, most authentic voices of the black community. Uh, so uh, Bruce Dixon and, um, and Glenn Ford over there, right, and, and their fine team have put together this, this analysis, which they've had for, for a while. Uh, Bernie is, is the sheepdog. And in particular, they point out that the Democratic Party has a track record of putting out a kind of a sheepdog or what I would call a stalking horse, a border guard, a gatekeeper, a left flank guard in particular. In the years when the, there is no incumbent, when there's no Democratic incumbent, if you have a Democratic incumbent like Obama 2012, right, it's, it's very difficult to get anything going in the Democratic Party against an incumbent Democratic uh, president. But in, in various years, they have uh, put this out, right? Bruce Dixon actually considers Jesse Jackson um, 1988 as such a kind of uh, flank guard or, or, as he puts it, sheepdog. Uh, and, and in uh, particular, you look at Howard Dean, for example, Howard Dean, right, 2004, Howard Dean in, in Vermont was considered a real right-wing Democrat, right, a, a conservative uh, Democrat, as well he might be, right? It's Howard Dean of Dean Witter, Dean Witter, a large uh, Wall Street uh, brokerage, and so uh, a rich guy with a big uh, Wall Street connection. But then somehow he gets profiled as the most radical anti War candidate. Remember his mantra: he represented the Democratic wing of the Democratic Party rather than the part the part that wanted to make uh, compromises. I would also point out Kucinich, right? In two thousand four, uh, he was there, and especially in two thousand eight. Uh, so Kucinich would essentially occupy that space. He'd suck people in with the help of his economics advisors, like Michael Hudson, who was part of this. They'd all come in there. Uh, and uh, and people would be frozen in place, right? They would not leave the uh, Democratic Party, but they would be sucked back into it, right? That would be the other thing would be maybe a uh, uh, a vacuum cleaner that's bringing them back in. So you have uh, Counterpunch has been doing yeoman service, and you've had uh, others who have been uh, pointing this out. Um, We've also got people going back to um, to rediscover commentaries about Bernie from 1999. Um, 1999, of course, was the year of the bombing of Serbia <clears throat> on the flimsiest of pretexts. Actually, in, in retrospect, it was completely uh, unjustified. It was done on the basis of hysteria. Christian Amanpour, Al Gore all cooperated. Prince Charles evidently cooperated. Uh, to, to start bombing Serbia. 